So you might be wondering, am I engaging my core properly? How do I know if I'm engaging my core properly? And things like that. So in this video, we are going to tell you how to determine if you are doing things correctly for your core. And we'll talk about some common progressions for just basic core engagement, breathing, and so on. I personally have had some experience with this. So I grew up doing gymnastics and I, for some reason, like when doing hollow body holds and things like that, I noticed my core like popping up or coning or doming. Um, and I didn't really know what it was. Over the years, it improved a little bit, but I never really was taught how to engage my core properly. And that definitely played a role in my overall strength. So after I learned in PT school, I ended up going back to the basics, even though I was doing some advanced training, I went back to the basics, retaught myself how to engage my core properly, and then slowly progressed back up over like three to six months. So this is gonna kind of show you the progression that I used, and hopefully you can find it helpful. These can be helpful after potentially some pregnancy, postpartum, um, after an abdominal surgery, just to make sure you're cleared by your medical provider before trying these. So one of the most overlooked things when you're training your core is just controlling your breathing mechanics. Depending on which exercise, there's different ways of doing it. There's a few different variations of breathing that we can kind of get into more details in a future video on, but I think the main thing to discuss here is just that we need, want to be controlling our intra-abdominal pressure. And it doesn't only apply to core training, but it's especially relevant because of the connections between your a lot of the core muscles that we think about commonly, the ones we don't think about commonly, and the diaphragm, uh, which is right there, <laughs> pretty much right about where all these ab muscles that we're frequently trying to train are. So a lot of people, when they focus on their breathing, they just worry about inhale, exhale, and I think that's a good start, and at minimum we should be doing that, but also think about where are we inhaling and also how are we controlling our exhale. So as we are inhaling, um, some people kind of describe it as creating a corset, where it's not just even talking about belly breathing here, but a 360 degree breath that you inhale. Um, so you can actually kind of mess around with your hands um, not while you're doing the exercise, so to speak, but think about when you try to take a nice deep breath, am I only expanding up here or only through my stomach, but am I also expanding laterally below my rib cage and also backwards this way as well. I think a lot of people quite literally uh, take as belly breathing and only breathe through their belly, uh, but in reality, we should be trying to breathe through that whole 360 degree range of motion. The other thing to go over real briefly there is the tension breathing component where we're controlling that exhale and maintaining that intra-abdominal pressure while we're exhaling. So are we just exhaling just to exhale and just so we can inhale again? Or at times it might actually be a quick or it might be a controlled exhale throughout the motion. Take for uh, ignoring core for a second, but a squat, right? Are we just and then we're here and then we still have to make up, make the full range of motion up, but we don't have any intra-abdominal pressure anymore. We're not stabilizing with our breathing as well. Or in that case, maybe we're controlling that motion and the pressure intra-abdominally throughout the range of motion. So just keep that in mind while we're doing some of these exercises and just while you're doing your core workouts, then again, that's the most simple way of putting it. It can get a lot more complex when you're talking about, especially with your core, sometimes you're doing something for a minute at a time and things like that. But I just kind of wanted to show you real briefly what that looks like in terms of just a one repetition exercise. Uh, most of the exercises you do will probably be more than that though, especially when it's core specific. And so you have to consider everything that's involved in your core. So as Steve mentioned, your diaphragm, you have your rectus abdominis, which is that six pack muscle that people think about. You also have your obliques coming around the side and you have a deeper muscle called your transverse abdominis. That's really important in creating the control of the intra-abdominal pressure. But you can't forget the muscles that come around the back, including some of your back muscles and the pelvic floor to create a little box where you're controlling that pressure within. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about intra-abdominal pressure control, where you have this little box in your body and you're maintaining that pressure. That way you can stabilize and work your muscles appropriately. A lot of times when you are not stabilizing things appropriately, you can get what's called coning or doming. So I'm gonna show you here. Here, so you just can see my stomach a little bit more. 
Here, I'm gonna do a crunch and I'm controlling intra-abdominal pressure here. So I, my back is staying flat on the ground, my stomach is fairly flat. But here, notice how my core wants to pop up in the middle when I'm doing that. So that is something that happens when I'm not engaging my core properly and when the intra-abdominal pressure is not maintained. So you can see this a lot with um, what's called a diastasis recti, which is basically a separation of your two abdominal muscles. So you have some fascia in between, and if that's separated, and this happens normally in pregnancy, just to create some space for the child. And so that does naturally heal, and but it's very important to monitor and make sure you're not getting a, the excess coning or doming when you're doing even just like getting up out of bed or things like that um, during that time and you're engaging the rest of your core to help support those tissues and allow the healing process to occur. So Steve here is going to show us a plank. So go ahead and go up into a plank. And right here, you can see his back is staying flat, his core is staying tight. So a lot of people, when they do planks, they aren't engaging their core properly, so they'll start to sink down and let the ribs pop out and back arch. Or they'll go ahead and come up a little bit and they'll stick their butt up and kind of come here. So this is another way. So you want to keep the hips tucked down. So squeezing the butt and then dropping the ribs down, creating that nice flat position there and pushing your elbows down into the ground to get a little bit more shoulder stability and core engagement. And then another common exercise that people do are leg lifts laying on your back. A lot of people do these with improper form. So our goal with this one is to keep your back flat on the ground here. So go ahead and bring the legs up. And then Steve is going to drop his legs down. Okay, and then coming back up. And notice how the back stays flat. A lot of people will let their back come up off the ground, and now they're really just using their hip flexors because they're not engaging the core properly. Sometimes it's a little bit easier when you're holding something in a weight in your hand to kind of help balance. So you're keeping your back flat on the ground and bringing the legs up with this. And then with the breathing that Steve was mentioning earlier, with this exercise specifically, you would typically exhale on the way down and do that tension breathing really throughout the whole entire motion there. So on the way down and on the way up because you're trying to maintain that core control and intra-abdominal pressure there. So one thing that we'll commonly do in the clinic or that you can do to kind of work on controlling your breathing is for starters, working on quiet breathing. So we're not focused on doing activity with this or moving the body. It's purely about accessing the diaphragm and promoting that expansion. So we talked a little bit earlier about how a lot of people belly breathe when they think diaphragm. So we're going to discuss more about breathing through the uh, sides and then breathing through the back. So the best position for breathing through your sides is going to be probably here. Very easy, you can get your hands actually underneath your rib cage. You can actually even try to reposition your hands here, um, depending, you might want to cross. I personally have only had a few people that like to cross while I do it. Usually coming out here, even kind of pointing down in this direction is easiest. And your goal here is to breathe without arching your back at all and focus on almost like you're trying to push your hands outwards as you inhale. And then we also talked about breathing backwards, and that'll work better when you're on your stomach. You can call this crocodile breathing. And really, you're just promotion, uh, trying to breathe just through your lower back. Again, pretty similar in terms of side of the waist to the low back actually being your target area in here. Personally, I like to have a cue in that area to think about pushing it up. So in this case, just the first thing I grabbed was a yoga block, but you'll see as she has that feedback it just makes it easier in the clinic sometimes we literally use ice packs heat packs sometimes we actually put weights as well on the back to actually promote that expansion um, and the muscle strength to some extent um, just to make it a little bit more challenging but and the weight is very light as well so it's like maybe yeah. like five pounds yeah I mean, like just like light weight. ankle yeah. weights not so much putting a 45 pound plate on your back but those are probably the two easiest things you can do. Again, the goal with these is not so much how hard can I make this. The goal is to improve your pattern so that way you can uh, utilize it during other activities.
Building on the diaphragmatic breathing, we're going to go into a transverse abdominus contraction or a TA contraction just to get the core firing and making sure we're contracting those deep stabilizing muscles. So essentially, if you take your fingers and you find your two hip bones on the side of your hips, you go in about an inch and then down about an inch, you're going to feel this muscle kind of harden or pop up into your hands as you're doing this. And that can be a good cue for feedback on if you're doing it properly because this one can be tricky so give yourself um, some grace while you're learning it and keep trying um, it does take some time so essentially you can sometimes depending on the person they can sometimes get it and just like tighten up the core just very gently and that muscle will pop on other people need and most people need a lot more cueing with this so there are a number of different cues that you can use some i personally like better than others but depending on your preference it might work so essentially, so Steve is going to go ahead and put his hands on his hips there so he can feel that muscle popping in. So you can do this and use like a blowing out of a candle. Um, and so when you exhale, you're going to feel that muscle pop on. The one thing I don't like about this cue is the fact that it requires the breath. So you want to then be able to hold that um, muscle contraction while you're breathing in and out. So that's where it can get a little bit tricky. So it's like with the exhale, you feel that muscle pop on, but you need to be able to maintain that and talk um, and breathe while you're maintaining that. Another common cue that people will hear is pretend like you're pulling on a tight pair of skinny jeans. Granted, this was more applicable when people were wearing more skinny jeans and they weren't as stretchy, but you still get the gist where you're sucking things in and you're gonna feel that muscle pop on. What I don't like about that cue necessarily is that you can get some pelvic floor contraction and some other muscles contracting. And then sometimes it's also just like a, almost like a little vacuum that people do instead of um, actually contracting. So a lot of people will try and like suck their stomach in, bringing like belly button to spine. Notice how Steve just kind of, but his core is not necessarily engaged when he does this. So versus when he does a TA contraction, it more just tenses up versus sucking in. So that's where like the belly button to the spine cue might not be appropriate. And then another way where you can progress this a little bit more, so once you have that TA contraction down, you can start incorporating that into a pelvic tilt. We are just taking your hips and you're tilting them backwards to push your lower back flat into the ground. So notice how he's not sucking in as he's doing it, he's using that TA contraction and pushing the low back and tilting the hips that way. So you can get a posterior pelvic tilt with this. This is the opposite of an anterior pelvic tilt where you create an arch in your back there. So we're trying to engage the core in a posterior pelvic tilt, keeping the ribs tucked down. A lot of people, when they do this, um, will tense up the shoulders as well. So you want to make sure you're not tensing up the shoulders and doing your crunch, or you want to make sure you're not just using your glutes and driving your heels into the ground to do that motion. Um, so a lot of people will squeeze their butt to then create that motion, you want to use your abdominals to pull your pelvis into a posterior pelvic tilt. So you're using these muscles, relaxing the glutes and the shoulders. Once you get that down and once you're able to breathe while you're doing that, so a lot of times you can maybe do a pelvic tilt, so pushing the back flat into the ground, engaging your core, and taking like two to three inhales and exhales in this position, and then you can relax. So you want to separate the breathing from the movement and then you can progress this and make this harder with different leg motions so essentially you can do a bent knee fallout where you're making sure your hips aren't twisting from side to side so steve is keeping his hips still and not letting them fall to one side versus the other and even like with a march for example you want to make sure that back is staying flat and you're not letting the back arch or hips shift slightly usually with the march it's more common to see it on the, as you're bringing your leg down is when you're going to see the back wanting to arch. And the same thing if you do a more advanced one, like the leg going out. So everyone usually focus, oh, I did it on my way up, but it's really the way down that you want to work on controlling it. That's going to be more essential to making sure that you have the proper activation. That's where you're more likely to find yourself cheating. And this is where adding that tension breathing with the motion um, can be helpful. And in that case with the tension breathing, because the priority really, especially with this one, is going to be as the legs lowering that you really want to make sure you're doing that controlled exhale on the way out. 
So next you can progress this to a quadruped position or different positions in general. So Steve is going to go on his hands and his knees in the quadruped position. Um, and then you can do that same thing, creating the you know, tension through the abdominal muscles with that TA contraction. And then you can challenge this more with um, an arm lift. So you can even play something like a foam roller yoga block on the back of the hips here to keep the hips still. And then, so raising the arm, Steve is not moving anything. A lot of people will then like allow the shoulder to drop or raise up. That's not what we want here. We're keeping everything still. And these are deceivingly hard too. So give yourself some time, give yourself some patience as you're working through these. Once you get that, then you can progress to leg lifts. So straightening out the leg. And this is a little bit harder. We're keeping the hips square towards the ground and not shifting from side to side. So a lot of people will kind of twist and lean there. You can use, again, a yoga block or something like that on the back of the hip. So here we have the yoga block and Steve is trying to maintain that staying still on the back. You want to make sure you're not overly arching your back as well with this. You're keeping those ribs tucked down. So you and see when you arch, if you do play something, it's really easy to keep it on there still, right? So that's just something that is, you know, not always the best cue depending on whether or not someone's watching it because what happens when I arch a lot is it kind of creates a little cavity for it to stay. So people sometimes arch their back excessively and it's the opposite of what we're looking for. So instead of rounding, they're arching and that cue is just something that needs to be monitored. So but it does help prevent more of the side to side motion and it tilting off. And then you can also then progress this to an opposite arm, an opposite leg lift, kind of like a traditional bird dog here. So those are just ways to progress that in different positions. Then you can go maybe like a side plank position and so on and so forth and apply this to different positions. And so you can progress this to a modified side plank and then all the way up to a side plank, progressing those holds um, and working on that control as well. And then you can apply these principles to all other exercises. So thinking going back to the leg lifts laying on your back, maybe some hanging abs, etc. and so forth, you can apply these principles throughout all of these core exercises that you're already doing in the gym. But make sure, again, you're not seeing any coding or dooming as you're doing this. And if it, you are, then it's too advanced for you at that point in time. Another thing to consider while you're doing these is that it's very easy to get stuck in these isolation exercises, but depending on what your goals are, trying to translate them into more functional activities, such as diagonal motions and even multiple steps, weights, etc. There's so many different ways to progress it, but I feel like that's usually more what you see online is all these fancy things that you can do, but usually if you don't have the basics down, you're just putting yourself at an increased risk of injury and it's actually not helping sports performance as much as if you mastered the basics before you did them. So I remember back when I was a collegiate athlete playing rugby and I was doing the planks and I would maybe put four or five 45 pound plates on my back as I was doing them and my, my back was arching like crazy. And I'm sure I was strengthening something, but I wasn't building very good habits. And at the same time, you think about uh, some of the positions, even I'll just use rugby specifically, where if that's what your body's habit is, is to arch your back excessively in order to create that position of stability, you're really increasing your risk of a back injury. So pretty much you are never too advanced to go back to the basics and learn that and then reapply it towards the exercises that you're already doing, but just with better form, just to help you overall. So if you are interested in some of those more advanced core exercises, I do have a follow along that I'll go ahead and link here, but feel free to drop any questions below um, and let us know if it was helpful.